having a party in Donetsk. 120 years after John Hughes founded this place, his descendants are back to an unbuttoned welcome. Here, in the city which was once named after him, Yuzovka. Huzovka. The Huses were kicked out in the revolution, and the town became Stalino. When the Nazis occupied the place, they tried to turn the name back to Yuzovka, but the Russians wouldn't have it. In 1943, the Red Army drove the Nazis out of Stalino. The soldiers came home to a time of hope, a time of tears. I too came home after the war to a welcome and a time of hope. As a young communist, I looked to this country for a major renewal of that hope. But what a task they faced, these people. Ruined homes, wrecked steelworks, flooded pits. When they drained these pits after the war, they found the best thing they could do was to turn back to John Hughes's original plans. They worked in a kind of frenzy, women mostly, they restored production with incredible speed. Production first, people second, as usual. By then, over 300,000 people crowding into the ruins. Maria Osipenko was one of them. Ну, он приведет на участок, возьмет нас, распланирует, чтобы добыч дать, кого на плита, кого куда. Ну, за бой же интересно. Так мы как полезли, вы знаете, он вот такой вот, вот как духовка. Не повернуться, ничего, раскричали, ну, пролезли. They worked in the shadow of Stalin and his monstrous new empire through the Cold War and the renewed terror. Then, suddenly, in 1953, the tyrant was gone. After Ivan the Terrible, who next? Enter Khrushchev, the cuddly bear. The local boy made good. He ended the terror. He freed five million people from the prison camps. He preached goulash communism. He rocketed Russians into space. This was the last chance to break out of a trap. The system was good at big things. It could create industries out of nothing. But in agriculture and distribution, it was bad. People lived by a black economy, and the whole structure of privileged party jobs which Stalin had created began to slump into an organized hypocrisy, with corruption seeping through it like a black slick. A now powerful and highly educated society couldn't house or feed its people properly. It offered them little comfort. This year we had the Sputnik, they said. Next year the Lunik? Who knows? Year after we might get shoes. Well, they got these flats anyway. The Khrushchev houses, people call them. The rooms are very, very small, but of good quality. And in Donetsk, these Khrushchev houses are much sought after today. But as late as 1970, the Soviet economy was still growing faster than the American. And in Khrushchev's spirit of boundless optimism, they threw off the past and tossed the name Stalino into the rubbish bin. The architects moved in on the ruins and in 1961 proclaimed the birth of Donetsk, jewel of the Donbass region, showcase of the communism of the future. Donbass, ты ночью так красив, рабочий мой Донбас, 
Thirty years later, the descendants of John Hughes, who founded this town, take a look at its successor, Donetsk. They liked what they saw. So did I. And uh, to really see it in its physical aspects, and what a beautiful place it is, too. It certainly is a beautiful city. Broad boulevards, spacious squares, 60 research institutes, five theaters, 500 libraries, roses everywhere. They green the slag heaps, pits of their own clinics, their own palaces of culture, their holiday resorts on the Black Sea. In the ideology, the worker, the miner, is the hero. Miners get twice the average wage here. Their pensions are bigger and they get them at 50, not 60. A Soviet film of the late 60s celebrated the miner and capital poured into Donetsk. And of course the place is dedicated to production. Coal, steel, machinery, excavators, refrigerators, bicycles, cables. But that's the point, isn't it? The 21 coal pits within the city limits, these huge Lenin steelworks which employ 17,000 people, the coal pits, the chemical works, and God knows what, which crowd in on the city on every side, choke it with fumes, coal dust, pollution. All those gardens and roses are in fact lifesavers. Without those green lungs, the place would be almost uninhabitable. She looks into a murky future. But this city stadium looks to the past. It's full of houses. On the sidelines, Nina Ivanovna, the unofficial granddaughter from the wrong side of the blanket. She is a summoned to join her official cousins. The family tree of the rulers of Soviet Russia is a sight less jolly. Late in the 60s, the mainspring started to uncoil. In the Brezhnev years, growth stopped. Civil technology stagnated. The ruling classes sickened into corruption. Here in Donetsk in 1970, they celebrated the 100th anniversary of their city in traditional style. But among the people, life expectancy actually fell from 66 to 62. Radical reconstruction, perestroika, became essential. It found its spokesman in 1985. But after four years, Gorbachev's calls for perestroika from below blew up in his face. And in July 1989, thousands of angry miners marched into the Great Square outside Communist Party headquarters. The unthinkable happened. 
the miners of the Workers' Republic went on strike. And the storm center, the Tonopandi, the Mahdi of this miners' strike, Donetsk. They set out a radical program. Производить оплату за время передвижения от ствола к рабочему месту и обратно в размере 100% тарифной ставки. Что выходит у нас? У нас очень далекие выработки. Шахты уже старенькие. Очень далекие выработки. По, по, у нас, по-моему, около 7 километров наша лава, например. Мы теряем на работу до 4 часов. They stayed in the square for five days and nights. They presented demands, shouted, argued, communist heads rolled. What powered these miners was huge resentment. Resentment at a regime which incessantly preached socialism while its semi-criminal ruling class lived the life of Riley as its people suffered. I understand their anger. They took me down the Gorky pit. Down a thousand feet. Look after the professor, they said. I needed it. It's six kilometers to the coal face. The professor rides in a coal drum, they walk. And before the strike, they weren't even paid for it. Above, girders buckle. The roof bulges. Hanging chains threaten to gouge your eye out. A week before I came here, six men were killed in the pit next door. At the face, men grovel through three-foot tunnels to get at the coal. Four of my uncles and both my grandfathers were colliers in some of the worst pits in South Wales. They'd never had to face this. And good God, this was supposed to be a workers' state. Я считаю, что нет. Она не дала того эффекта. У нас и добыча упала, и потеряли мы за эту забастовку в денежном отношении. Навряд ли будут. У шахтеров довели до крайности, потому что таких условий, по-моему, как у шахтеров, ни у кого таких нет. And what sort of homes do they come up to? Lots of flats, but not enough. Cheap, but hideously cramped. Every person in the Soviet Union should have nine square meters of living space. Half the miners on strike had five, 
A further quarter had less than four. Several families share this courtyard. Vladimir Trofimenko lives here. He's quite well off. He trained as a refrigeration engineer, but moved to the pits for the money. Vladimir has a wife, two little kids, and a baby. Where do you and your wife sleep? There? Yeah, and the children here? Yeah. Oh, yes. 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 How do you manage with this house? Well, 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 how do you Должен получить государственную квартиру, но сейчас пока не получается. Там у нас такие махинации вместе с этим. Короче, получает 211 по очереди, а я вот только жду жеребьевки. Я первый по очереди стою, но не получилось. Не вызвали там. Это проблемы наши советские. Do you have any hope in Perestroika? Мне это когда начиналась перестройка, я еще верил в что-то, а сейчас я уже ни в чем не верю. Да я еще что-то на что-то надеюсь. Seventy years after the workers' revolution, many villages have no gas. Some don't even have cold running water. A fifth of the population lives in decrepit houses, or else has no fixed accommodation, whatever. Here in Donetsk itself, these old houses, without running water, stand cheek by jowl with this modern block of luxury flats built by the city's architects for themselves. In this troubled city, its Soviet gives a civic reception to the descendants of John Hughes. One of its new people's deputies, Igor Fincherov, they booted a communist out and voted him in. He welcomed the Hugheses back and said many people in Donetsk felt they'd have been better off if the Hugheses had never gone away. He felt sufficiently at ease to make a joke out of skeletons in the family cupboard. But we uh, didn't forget Hughes, of course. And we still remember John Hughes here in Donetsk. Я имею в виду также его усилия по увеличению народа населения в данной местности. I am speaking about his efforts to increase the population of um, the of the of this area. Что выразилось в наличии у него большого количества детей от самых, как говорят, различных представителей прекрасной половины рода человечества. Тут надо было разбить In the steelworks, which John Hughes first created, there was no strike. Для того, чтобы, так сказать, забастовать, допустим, Мартеновскому цеху, надо остановить все печи. Это технически это можно осуществить, но тогда доменные печи, так сказать, им некуда будет давать свою продукцию. То есть придется останавливать весь комплекс, весь Мартенов, весь завод. А это, так сказать, для металлургов чревато последствия. Тем более, что металлурги поддерживали выступления шахтеров, но прекращать работу они не собирались, потому что это привело бы еще к более экономическому кризису и в нашей республике, и в том же даже регионе Донбассе. Поэтому только с этих соображений мы не бастовали. У шахтеров, наверное, более крепкая организация, чем у нас. У нас нету такого. Ну, они, не знаю, как 
шахтах большое все-таки образование такое, а цех наш маленький, а и цеха разрозненные. Нет у нас такого, чтобы ну, вместе все были. Ну, поэтому. А может быть не довели нас до этого. Может быть. Поэтому не, не знаю. Ну, я считаю, что у нас металлурга, наверное, столько нет претензий, сколько у шахтеров. Поэтому мы остались в стороне. У них опаснее работа. У Нам них все-таки более тяжелый труд и опасный, чем у нас. А мы в общем стороне остались. У меня муж, например, лично мой муж шахтер. Шахтер. И труд, я считаю, что труд шахтеров очень тяжелый. И малооплачиваемый труд. Конечно, я поддерживаю все требования шахтеров в первую очередь. В первую очередь, чтобы повысили им заработную плату, чтобы увеличили им количество отпускных дней. Ну и все их не остальные требования. In fact, miners are still the best paid. It isn't a question of wages. In this city, after they'd won their strike, as they thought, they formed an independent miners' union and issued a proclamation. We are the working class. The Communist Party no longer represents us. We call upon all workers to leave the Communist Party. At the Gorky mine, the mine they'd taken me down, they held a meeting. Should they kick the Communist Party out of the pit? And all around them the dams are breaking. Miners' Day. This used to be communist political theater at its most spectacular, all parades and speeches. Today, every pit stages its own carnival, what back in Merthyr, where John Hughes came from, we used to call a fete and gala. <laughs> the church, on that same day, in full revival, this one was built by John Hughes himself at the heart of the old town. The city Soviet has just officially renamed that old town center Yuzovka. Yuzovka is back on the map, and this is no longer a church for the old and the defeated. Young people come with their children. The church is full. The political meeting on that same Sunday, thin and sparse. Here, radical mayors demand reform while a man stages what has become his regulation anti-communist protest. Ukrainian flags, but little Ukrainian nationalism. Their politics have lapsed into confusion. <laughs> In this genial but confused town, they celebrate. They celebrate the Welshman John Hughes who created it, a classical 19th century capitalist. A thousand feet beneath us, these poor dubs hack their lives away for a communist state which loudly proclaims itself their own workers' state. John Hughes, for all his paternalism, presided over a community which was even more wretched than those his predecessors had created in South Wales. And these men work in communist conditions which are as bad as those in South Wales 150 years ago.
Where does this leave a man like me, who once supported this state and despite everything still understands and shares the thinking and the feeling that created it in the first place? Where's Professor Williams? Suspended in limbo. That's where it leaves me. This place is a tissue of contradictions. The pits have spotless clinics, and the city hospital doesn't even have hypodermic needles. It is somehow characteristic that all those roses bloom so magnificently because disease-bearing spores cannot live in the polluted air. The people here come stumbling out from under the carapace of Stalinism. They grope after freedom, sufficiency, dignity, while all around gibber black monsters out of Russia's dark past. Many now stampede after the market as their salvation. The market has been proven essential, but an unfettered capitalist market has made an even bigger mess in the third world than the communists have here. In the 30s, the market nearly eliminated my own people from history. In that time of misery and anger, many of us looked to this place for a life-giving alternative. That was delusion. But now here, in their stampede into the market, they are talking about shutting down every pit in the Donbass. Good God! Is the market going to kill this great city like it killed our coal industry? Знаете, за существование сколько советской власти. Эти старые, которые у нас были президенты, они обюрократились, растащили все. А сейчас надо по новой все это навернуть. In March 1991, 46 of the pits, a quarter of the miners, went on strike again because promises had not been kept. Their strike rapidly became wholly political. In May, they went back. They have wrested control of the pits from the Kremlin to their own Republic of the Ukraine. What will they do with it? When I look at these kids starting their new school year and think of the Russia they're growing up in, my stomach turns over. But if there is hope anywhere, it must be here. From these kids will come the people who may one day create a decent life and a decent society here. God in heaven, they've earned it. <laughs> 